Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're talking to a man who is a competitor, an event promoter, and a low and slow specialist butcher. Hey family, hope you're doing well wherever you are and you got that thin blue smoke rolling. This is a great episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast we've got for you today. We've got Luke Nagel from Kelly's Meats. He's a man who is a keystone of the barbecue scene in Victoria. But before we get into that, I've just got a few announcements that I need to run by you first. The first is that our podcast partner program is well underway. So what we've done is we've set up a five episode or 10 episode sort of joint partnership program. And we've got a couple of case studies now that we can share some information. So the first business partner with us for five episodes on our gold level program. And across those five episodes, we managed to get a total views and listens combination of 51,221 with a total reach of 171,489. And then for the second business, for the second go round, we managed to get a total combined view and listenership of 82,500 and a total reach of just under a quarter million. So that's really impressive. And if you've got a barbecue business out there and you'd like to get your message out to the masses, send me an email, send me a direct message, and we'll have that conversation. Now, if you're at the opposite end of your journey, if you're just at the start, it's time to head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com and pick up your free copy of our ebook, The Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. That's a great little ebook. It's got everything you need to get up and running with low and slow barbecue. No more burnt sausages, no more boring food. It's a great bit of gear and was recently awarded at the NBBQA annual awards over in the United States. Now, if you're joining us today, I can see we've been live for about two minutes now and we've already got well over a dozen people joining us. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you've got questions for Luke today or you've got some comments you want to add, pop them in the comments underneath this live video recording and I'll put them to him a bit later in the episode. But if you're new to this, we are recording this live in the Facebook community, in the Smoking Your Confessions Barbecue community over on Facebook. So head on over, check that out. It's a great place to hang out and talk about barbecue and you can be a part of these live recordings, which is pretty cool too. Now, if you're joining us on the socials later on, if you're watching on YouTube, do give us a thumbs up or subscribe and hit that little notification bell. If you're watching it later on on Facebook, it's all about the likes, the comments and the shares over there. IGTV, it's all about the cute little hearts and the comments and the follows. And of course, if you're listening in on a podcasting app, if you're able to, if you could rate and review, that would be really helpful. Um, with your ratings and reviews, it helps, it helps to push us up the charts. And in the last 30 days, we've been as high as number six, yes, six on the US podcasting charts for food and three in Australia for the podcasting charts for food. So that's pretty cool. And a lot of that comes down to that, that help that you give us with those ratings and reviews. All right. But now today we do have Luke joining us from Kelly's Meats. Um, he is an absolute genius when it comes to the business of butchery and promoting low and slow barbecue. He's a competitor. He's competed in Australia and in the US. He's hosted his own comps here and he manages the iconic Kelly Meats uh, butchery shop in Melbourne. Now, I think that's about all the talking up you need out of me. Let's bring Luke in here. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? Good morning, Luke, my friend. How are you, buddy? Good, mate. How are you going? Mate, I'm doing well. Uh, I, I think you're very brave uh, recording outside on a nice chilly Melbourne morning. I can see you got your, your your hoodie and your beanie there. Yeah, yeah, I'm good to go. It's about eight degrees, I reckon, in uh, sunny old Melbourne. Ooh, eight degrees, man. I would be dying. I think it's about 15 or 16 degrees here today and I've got my hoodie on. And if I didn't have my, uh, my, my cans on, my, my uh, hood would be up on my hoodie as well. I'm a bit <laughs> soft now. I've moved to Queensland. So, mate, what was the last thing that you barbecued? Uh, it was a lamb shoulder probably last week. Um, yeah, loving love lamb at the moment. We use uh, Butcher's Axe Hunter Rub, uh, hot and fast, uh, wrap it about four hours in. and because of the kids, the kids don't, they're getting a bit over the, the pulled meat, so we made it into tacos. Oh, nice. Nice. Got those little, little taco boats and put some capsicum and all that kind of stuff in there, so something different. 
Yeah, sounds delicious, man. Sounds absolutely awesome. Give us a bit of an idea about how you like to hot and fast a lamb shoulder. So basically run it at about 275 Fahrenheit um, in the GMG. And when it hits about 160 Fahrenheit internally, wrap it, a little bit of butter, um, let it go, push it even harder, go up to 320. And yeah, when it hits about 205, 210, you're generally done. Nice, beautiful. I actually did a couple of lamb shoulders myself last weekend for the Brisbane Barbecue Festival. And oh. uh, we, we had some leftovers, and last night it went into a lamb stew. It was sensational. Yeah, stews, pies. It's, that's the good thing about pool meat. You can make into something else if there's leftovers, but generally there's not any leftovers. No, no, usually not. No, no. Give us a bit of an idea of these tacos. How did you go about that? Were they birria tacos? No, no, no. Just uh, you know, the little boats you can buy at the supermarket. Um, yeah, just use those and then put the lamb in there. It was, it was pretty runny because of all the butter and everything. So mix a bit of sauce in there, the heavenly hell hot sauce. I don't know if you've seen that. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. So their lamb almighty, use that. Um, yeah. And a bit of capsicum and onion, just freshen it up a little bit. Beautiful, beautiful. Mark McDonald's jumped on Facebook there and just says, morning, Luke. Good morning, Mark. How are you going, champion? <laughs> Awesome. Now, mate, tell me, what is your, your favourite barbecue? Do you cook on a drum? Do you prefer a Weber? What are you into? Um, well, we stock GMGs here at uh, Kelly's, so that's probably been the, the go-to over the last 12 to 18 months, but I recently got a couple of drums off DrewBQ, and, well, like, they are good. <laughs> I, I was just uh, flicking through your socials there last night, and I saw that photo of the matching pair of drums. They look fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, no, they are awesome to cook on. Um, I can't believe you know, I only got a little bit of charcoal in there and it lasts hours. I couldn't believe it. So good, man, yeah. So what, what drew you to the drums then? Uh, they look pretty. <laughs> everyone's, <laughs> cooking, everyone's cooking on them at the moment. Um, everyone's getting good results from barbecue comps. So just thought, oh, we'll, we'll give it a go. And once you dial them in, you're set. Um, the temp will just come along. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I have heard the drums are great for all that. That sounds awesome. Now, tell me, what is your favourite meat to barbecue then? Is it is it lamb shoulder or do you prefer to get into something else? Uh, probably lamb shanks. They're nice and easy. Just let them pull back a little bit off the bone and then some red wine, some veggies on top. Let it sit in there. Um, yeah, you don't have to really worry about them too much. There's not much, you know, wrapping or anything like that. It's pretty straightforward. I think Michael from Butcher's Axe was messaging me on the weekend. He goes, oh, I'm doing some lamb shanks. How do you do them? Because he loves them. <laughs> wow when the when the axe is uh is consulting you for cooking tips that's when you know you're onto something good exactly <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a bit of a smoked bourguignon then is it yeah so probably an hour hour and a half smoking for and then once they've pulled back and they're gone nice and brown just dropping in some red wine uh some stock uh let that go for a little bit and then just veggies carrots um celery potatoes whatever you're into and then wrap it up and yeah four or five hours later it's just falling off the bone god that sounds amazing so good so mate what which came first for you barbecue or butchery uh butchery tell us how you got into that probably 24 years ago so more than half my life now <laughs> um started at Len leonard's chicken and i was working as like the cleanup kid out the back making sausages at night time um, probably get out of there at 10 o'clock at night, even on a school night, which is pretty crazy. Um, did that for probably six months and there was a butcher shop next door and they were after someone they kept talking to me and I said, come on, come on, quit school, come, come be a butcher. So in the end I gave in and I started working there. I think I did 12 to 18 months there. And you know, the, the typical like being an apprentice, I wasn't really getting anywhere. I wasn't doing anything new or exciting and I just wanted to do more. So I ended up leaving and I went to another butcher shop. Um, it was a little butcher shop and it was run by, um, well, his name was Mario. And it was just him. That was it. And it was just me and him in this little strip shop. And he goes, you can do whatever you want. So oh, basically wow. cutting up full animals, doing everything. Um, did that for probably another 12 months and then went back to my original job and I was pretty much fully qualified. They couldn't believe, you know, that they've got me for cheaper now, but I was, you know, Paying me less, but I can do everything. And I was like, oh, geez, you know, that, that was a good thing for them. And then I ended up at Kelly's Meats in 2002. And I've been there now for 19 years, so 20 years next year. Wow. Okay. So, so you've got some uh, long service leave coming up next year. 
Just a, just a little bit, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what are you planning to do with that time? Are you going to head over to the States if, you've, uh, if, if we're able to travel? Um, yeah, definitely. If, if we can go back to the States, that'd be amazing. Um, I'm not one for holidays. I, I do like work. I'm a bit of a workaholic, so we'll probably go away, you know, Queensland or something like that, um, take a bit of time away, get some sun on our back. Well, we've got quite a few uh, good barbecue joints up here now. So instead of heading to the States mm-hmm. and doing a barbecue tour of Texas, you could come to Queensland and do a barbecue tour of Queensland. Exactly. It's getting big. I think I'm going to have to pitch that to, uh, to, to the Queensland Tourism Board, see if I can uh, throw some dollars my way. Good idea. The next big marketing campaign. So, mate, um, what, what was it that actually drew you to butchery? Is it, is it because you love meat or is it, um, is it the, the, the art of, of breaking down the beast from a whole beast into individual pieces? What, what sort of keeps you motivated and, and keeps you involved in butchery? So at first, it was the breaking down of carcasses and you know, learning all those kind of things, um, you know, where they came from. Why is it done this way? Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. But now it's more about the flavours. So making different sausages or cabana or you know, it's all those new inventive things that we can do. That's, that's probably the real driving force for me now. Um, I think we've got 35 different flavoured sausages at the moment. So, yeah. 35 different flavoured sausages. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I walk into some butcher shops and you see two or three flavours and then I'm like, geez, we're, we're doing a few. And, yeah, we've got powering through them. And the boys are very creative here as well. They love coming up with new ideas. I think two weeks ago we made a meat pie at Cabana. Um, you know, just randomly on a Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, they're all sold out. Um, you know, people go, oh, can you make that again? Yeah, I think we've got 10 or 12 Cabanas on display at the moment. Wow. So yeah. is that like a, like a personal passion of yours? Are you, uh, are you right into mixing up all the different sausages? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, every Tuesday morning, we make probably 500 kilos of sausages on a Tuesday. Wow. Yeah, all, all done by hand. I think four of us getting stuck into it probably takes five or six hours. Wow, oh, that's so cool. And how do you come up with all the different ideas for all the different flavours? Do you sit down and have like a brainstorming session or do you, are you like uh, Ben and Jerry's and you keep a little notebook on you at all times and just write down little flavours that you come across that you like? Yeah, I do use my phone a fair bit, um, my little notebook, where if I see someone, you know, another butcher shop somewhere in Australia do something, I was like, oh, that, that looks good. I might, I could do that, but I'll just have to tweak it a little bit to do this. Um, but we made some blueberry orange sausages once, and I thought they were absolutely beautiful, but no one liked them. <laughs> oh, really? I, that sounds fantastic to me. Yeah, something different. Yeah, yeah, nice. Now, is that... This sort of passion for, for sausages, I understand that you've won Sausage King five times in a row. Can you tell us a bit about that? No, no. Um, so we just had Sausage King on the weekend, um, the regional competition, and we got five first places for the sausages and hamburgers. Ah, okay, right. Sorry, I, I, I misunderstood that. Yeah. What was the sausage that, uh, that, that took out the first place there for you in that? Uh, we're still waiting on the results, but I've been told our merguez lamb sausage got first place. Um, and traditional English pork with mustard. Wow. Okay. What was that first one again? Merguez. Merguez. It's a Moroccan sausage. Oh, nice. Yeah. Very nice. A bit of heat, but um, yeah, very nice. Being lamb, it's it's a little bit dry. Um, yeah. That sounds incredible. And the hamburger was the other one. Did you say? Yeah, we got our first, second, and third in hamburgers, but we're not too sure which one came <laughs> first, second, or third yet. You you took all three, first, second, and third. That's awesome. Yeah, clean sweep of the burgers. Yeah, yeah. So, mate, how how have you seen butchery evolve since you started? I mean, your your career is more than twenty years now in in butchery. How how have you seen low and slow evolve? Oh, sorry, have you seen butchery evolve in the face of low and slow? Uh, would it be maybe five years ago? Um, we didn't stock briskets, short ribs, pork butts, anything like that. And people started to ask. When people start asking me a lot, you've got to start looking at, okay, well, why are they asking you? you know, what's so good about this? And um, there was a couple of barbecue teams that shot with us and kept hounding me. So in the end, I started getting a few things in. And, yeah, once we started promoting it, the, it was unbelievable. Um, it came from everywhere. From back in the day, having a butcher shop, it was more, you know, here's your steaks. Uh, you know, you've got 
got a couple of choices of sausages. Not very exciting. Um, but now you're going up against supermarkets and they've got you know, massive displays for different things and you've got to kind of keep up with the times and what everyone else is you know, doing as well. Yeah, no doubt about that at all. And so in that regard then, have you seen uh, like a change in the training for new butchers? Like uh, when, you're bringing, when you're now bringing in new apprentices, do you train them in low and slow? Do you teach them to, to break down beasts in, in different ways? Um, well, the breakdown of the beast, it's pretty much the same for low and slow or not. It's a matter of whether you'd save those low and slow cuts. Um, back, back in the day, you wouldn't save, you know, you'd have a couple of beef ribs, you'd save them for asado ribs, but you wouldn't save them for low and slow, you know, big, nice, juicy beef ribs. It just didn't exist back then. But now, yeah, definitely, um, you know, it's like save every single one you can get. Um, and then the training, the training's not as hard as what it used to be. Look, apprentices these days coming through, they don't have to break down as many animals. It's not like the old days. Um, you know, most butcher shops, I mean, when I started, was 20, 25 bodies a week that would have to break down of cows. Now, you know, most butcher shops are doing two or three, and you buy everything else in the boxes. Um, you go for the branding, all that kind of stuff. So it has changed, definitely. Interesting. Why do you think that that has, that that has evolved like that? Uh, pricing. Um, and basically, if you've got a butcher shop and you, know, you sell Osso Buco and you've got, you've got X amount that come on the cattle, so you only have two bodies, you've only got this much. Well, now you can buy a whole box from somewhere else and then you've got also Buco for the week. So you just have to adapt to you've got your primary cuts that you've always got and then if something sells out, now you can buy it in boxes. And it's reasonably the same price as buying it as a full body when you break it down. Right. So basically what you're saying is you get more flexibility to meet market demands. Exactly, yes. Interesting. That's really cool. All right, so now tell me, how did you get into barbecue then? Uh, so um, Jared Keith, who is the son of one of the workers um, that were here, he kept hounding me, going, come on, mate, get, get me some briskets, get me this. So in the end, I said, all right, and we started getting it in, and then he told a few mates, and then they told a few mates, and he goes, why don't we have a team? I said, a team? Like, where do we even start? So we started a team, we called the um, Dirty Old Basters. And we went and competed at Yak and Ale. Um, it was one of the one of the KCBS comps. And there's only nine teams at the comp, and we were the most unexperienced. Had a great time, just all caught, caught up with people that we knew, and go, you know, we should give this another go. And then we did meat stock, and I think we got first place brisket. Um, that was pretty cool. But we, apart from that, we pretty much won nothing. I don't even know how we won that brisket, to be honest. Mate, first place brisket at uh, at meat stocks, very impressive. Yeah, it was good. It was um yeah, sure wagyu. So we jumped on board with them at the time, and yeah, that was proof in the pudding. Yeah, we had to stick with them. Yeah, they seem to be very popular at the moment. I see um a lot of teams are getting quite into them and and using them a lot. Yes, yeah, definitely. It's um by far our biggest selling brisket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you would um. You would have grown up then in Australia, like in the age of the the brick barbecues with the with the iron panel across, and you know burning sausages and steaks and onions every Sunday. Mate, yeah. How do you? Uh, what do you recommend people to sort of get into if they want to get into low and slow? If they, if they want to move away from grilling and get into into some low and slow, how how do you recommend they do that? Well, you can start off pretty cheap with a Weber or you know Finetto or something like that from Bunnies. That's, that's the easiest way to get into it. And then just research. Um, yeah, it's, once you start research, there's so much information out there. Um, our Victorian Barbecue Alliance page, we've got files of how to cook things and stuff like that. So customers come in and go, how do I do beef shorties? Open up Facebook, click on files. It's all there, ready to go. Yeah, you've got some, what, 15,000 people or something in that Facebook group now. That's huge. We just hit 14,000 on the weekend, so we're going to give away another smoker. Ooh, nice. What's that one? Uh, GMG, Daniel Boone, worth about 1900 bucks. We're going to draw that on Monday. So anyone who shops with us, they put their name and phone number on the back of their receipt and we'll just randomly draw a winner next Monday. That's so cool, man. Those, uh, those um, Boones, are the, they're the biggish ones, aren't they? They're the ones that a lot of the competitors use. Oh, it's the mid-sized one. The, the big ones, you can get away with the, the Daniel Boones for competing. The big ones are more if you're going to be doing a bit, bit of catering and 
having a lot of people over, but yeah, for what you're going to cook in there, the boons are the perfect size. Yeah, awesome. I I love them. They sound absolutely fantastic. Now, tell me what um what is it about barbecue that that keeps you so motivated in it? Probably probably the people. Um, you you meet a lot of different people. Um, you made heaps of really good friends out of it. Um, you know they they come into the shop and they'll be messaging you that morning. I'm coming in. Are you going to be there at ten? And I'm like, yep. Yeah. They'll come in and we'll go up and have a coffee and you know just just talk talk about what's going on out there and yeah it's, I think it's just all about the people and it just brings everyone together there's a lot of people that were let's say they were just kind of on the outer they didn't really have a hobby they didn't once they get into barbecue they've found all these new friends and yeah it's really good got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation Alrighty, so now let's get stuck into Kelly Meats itself. On the website, it says there's over a hundred years experience at at Kelly's Meats. So, give us a bit of an idea of of the history of the business of the shop. Okay, so we've got a couple of older gentlemen that work for us. So these are hundred years, probably in those two fellas. Um, they're, they're rippers. They've been in the industry. Like they're pushing both around seventy, um, but they work as hard as anyone else. Um, they've got a lot of experience, especially with customers. They've had to adapt to low and slow, just like everyone else. Um, but they've they've taken their stride, and you know they're they're at home cooking as well now. So it's, it's really good to see. That's awesome. Yeah, the um the oftentimes there's somewhat of a resistance to change, and so that's that's great to see that those guys are fully embracing the low and slow movement and and getting stuck right into it. We, I visited a couple of butchers up here on the Gold Coast and I found a lot of them just had no idea what I was talking about at all. Um, yeah. I f- f- for example, a couple of years ago, I decided I was going to do some tri-tip. I had to visit 17 butchers before uh-huh. before anybody even knew what I was talking about. Yeah, uh, it can be like that. But um, we, we, we cook a lot at work as well. So we explain to the staff and we show them how to cook things. They'll even cook things on, on the smoker out the front. So then once they've done it, they they're more confident to be able to explain to people how to do things. Right. So you actually got, uh, run a smoker at the shop so you can teach people how to cook what they've just bought. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And even just for the staff. So they've got the knowledge as well, um, you know, because you've got the files. But when you do something, once you've done something, you go, right, I know how to do that now. And, you know, if someone can walk in off the street and go, how do I do this? The girls can tell them exactly how to cook it because they've done it before. Yeah, that's a great idea. I love that. Now, it also says that you have the largest trophy cabinet of first-place trophies in, in Australia. Tell us about that. So we've got a few teams that were sponsored over the years that have been you know, fairly successful, um, which is that they've won the Australian Championship, obviously. Um, I think they've got the most pork trophies, so for pork ribs, um, than anyone else. Uh, they've all come from us. And we've got the Smoke Face Gorillas. Um, they had a, a great two- or three-year period there where it, you know, you'd walk up to a comp and you'd be like, oh, geez, smoke face gorillas again. But, um, yeah, all those trophies, they were all here at one stage and, yeah, we needed a whole room for them. So, yeah, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, wow. So what's the sort of the the range of the different trophies there? You've mentioned pork ribs and uh, and some butcher's axe ones. Is it is it just the low and slow trophies or have you got trophies in, we mentioned Sausage King earlier and all that sort of stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've um, we've won Sausage King many many years ago. Before I actually worked at Kelly's Meats, he um he won the traditional uh, beef sausage. Um, so he won the Australian Championship. It was pretty cool. The trophy's downstairs. Probably needs a bit of a polish. It's um it's sitting on the top of the shelf. But hopefully we can get some more this year. And um yeah, we'll have five trophies at least coming. So that's good. Yeah, and what is the the importance of the trophies to a business like Kelly's? Um, it just shows you're on the right path. Um, you know, it's not about you can have as many customers as you want, but if you're not winning trophies and you're not um, growing and people can't see that, well, then it's not really worth it. You, you want to be put yourself out there and, you know, have a crack. And, you know, we, we did really well to win five, five firsts, three seconds and five thirds that we got um, on the weekend out of all the categories. So, yeah, we'll go to the um, Victorian Championship now and hopefully we can do well and onto the Australian one. Yeah, that sounds incredible. When's that on? Uh, dates to be date to be advised at this stage. 
Ah, yeah, good point. Good point. <laughs> yeah, it all depends on border closures and whatnot. Yes. Yeah, it gets a bit tricky. Um, well, best of luck when that happens, because um, I I know that uh, you guys are going to nail that. Just having a quick chat about um, all the different places that you just took out. Now, one of the things that I did see is that you've actually worked with Boar's Night Out, one of the most famous barbecue teams out there. Their their rubs, the the White Lightning, and the different variants of White Lightning are are, are a secret of the well. It's an open secret on the competition barbecue scene. Tell us about how that experience came about for you. Uh, so Trent, Trent Lawrence, who runs SCA in Victoria, um, he's good friends with them. He's been over there to compete with them a few times. Um, wow. Whenever, yeah. And whenever American teams come out that Trent talks to, they'll, um, they'll speak to me and say, look, you know, can you get us this? Can you get us that? And White Lightning would have to be the most popular rub that we sell. And when I found out and put Trent and them together, I said, Trent, if they're coming out, I, I have to be part of that. And he said, yep, yeah, I'll organise it. And into a group chat we went. And next thing you know, we started organising <clears throat> for meat stock last, last year. Was it last year? Yeah. And they came out for the trip. And, yeah, I was going to compete with them. We're going to have a class and all that kind of stuff. Um, unfortunately, meat stock didn't go ahead. So we ended up travelling down to um, Sheepdog's house in Torquay. And we pushed on with the competition still. And I competed with them. And... Eric got a first place in Australia for SCA for steak. Um, so that was pretty cool. And they just showed me all the, you know, all the tricks that they were doing and yeah, learned heaps of them, but good fellas, like, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Yeah. They've certainly bring a lot of, uh, a, a lot of experience and knowledge to the table, don't they? Yeah. They've invited us to go to uh, Memphis in May when we can actually travel over there. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I think there's going to be a whole crew of us going over there to compete with them. Memphis in May, that sounds awesome. Now, that, that won't be your first time competing in the States, though, will it? No, no, we've been before um, as the uh, All-Stars, <laughs> funnily enough. Yeah, right. What was that experience like? Oh, unbelievable. Um, there was a group of five of us went over there. Um, we were going to compete at the Royal for both days, and we made a little bit of a holiday out of it and probably went oh, for two weeks and just travelled around, uh, went to Louisiana, um, Oklahoma, uh, Texas, um, and then the Texas Wizards from America, they loan, loaned us everything that we needed and they travelled around with us for the competition and, yeah, just an amazing experience. I think we got seventh in vegetables <laughs> at the Royal. Vegetables? Yeah. There you go. That was different. And we got in the top 30 for uh, brisket at the Royal, so that was cool. That's an outstanding achievement. Isn't the Royal something like 600 different barbecue teams or something like that? Yeah, something ridiculous like that. Um, the first day, yeah, I think 600, and the second day is 150, and we've got 30 in the top 30 both days. So, yeah. Wow. That's outstanding. And so yeah. how, how do you find competing in Australia different to competing in the States? Um, well, it's a lot bigger over there. It's... um. A lot more serious, I guess. Um, but the people over there, they're so willing to help you, no matter who you are, what you are. If you're a competitor, they're just they're over there. They're showing you what they think, and yeah, it, it was just really it opened your eyes because they source a lot of their briskets and stuff where we don't do that here. And when we had a look at the ones that won, they were all sourced. So there's a difference between the the way they barbecue and what they hand it over there to here. Ours is a bit more. It's, it's a bit more clear cut. So when you do a brisket, it's absolutely perfect. Over there, it can have jagged marks on it. It doesn't matter. Source it up. It's all about the flavour. And, yeah, they, it, it tastes it, – it's just different over there in the sense it's – although it's been there for a long time, it seems like we're very finesse and they're just old school. And their stuff's amazing, though. Um, and the briskets – we took our own briskets over there and they couldn't believe it. The marbling that we had on our briskets, they'll go, jeez. <laughs> Were they Sherwag you as well? Yeah, we took six Sherwag you briskets over there um, in part of our luggage and got them through customs, thank God. Um, but, yeah, we, we used those and, yeah, top 30 in the world, so that was pretty pretty good effort. Very impressive, mate. Very impressive indeed. And so when I was over there, well, I, and, and I did pretty much a similar tour to you through, uh, through Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, um, up into Kansas City, I found that um, when it came to competing, a lot of the 
their briskets and that, they seem to taste a lot saltier. Did you find that there seems to be a lot more salt um, on the different uh, comp teams' hand-ins that you got to try? Um, I think a few teams were brining their briskets and things like that. Um, we brining? Go, yeah, like injecting and uh, doing a lot more to it. We, we tried to just let the meat speak for itself. Um, you know, we just did it like, we, we just tried to treat it like we're in Australia because if you try to do what they're doing, you're not going to do it right. So you might as well just do what we know and have a go and you know, hope for the best. And yeah, that's what we did. And I think we're pretty happy with our results. Mate, they were absolutely incredible. So good. Now, when you said that you went, went on a bit of a tour there, did you get to go to many of the different barbecue restaurants over there? Oh, heaps. Um, I, I sat out a few of them because I was putting on a bit too much weight. But um, <laughs> the other boys, they, they did everything. Um, they went to Snowy's. They went to Franklin's. Uh, we went to Tree Oaks Distillery, which was probably the, the best place that we ate at. Um, that was a friend of ours, and he went over and looked after us. And yeah, they make their own bourbon as well, which was pretty cool. Um, and then just the places that were fun to eat at were the ones on the side of the road that you don't know about. And you you, you walk in there, and it was I think it was called Hanks, and it was just this rundown little shack. And we went in there and we ate. It was absolutely beautiful. And he took us out the back, showed us, you know, smoking his sausages out the back. And, yeah, it was just meeting those people was really, really cool. Yeah, it's quite often those little hole-in-the-wall places that are the most surprising, I find. Yeah, and banana pudding at um, it was called Rolling Smoke. I think me and Ross Walker had about 15 banana puddings each there. It was unbelievable. <laughs> that was in Austin, yeah. Right. I'd, uh, I'd, I can only imagine what sort of was going on later on for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> after that many bananas yes oh goodness gracious so if you had to pick like uh, one spot to recommend to to people to go to put on their their bucket list barbecue tour what would that be it would be Treaty Oaks Distillery that was but the, the venue it was um, acres and acres of land just trees there was families there that live music um, they're making their own bourbon the food was just ridiculous um you know, he had pickled uh, strawberries and things like that on the plate, just things you wouldn't think of. And it just cut through with the brisket and all that meat you were eating and it just went really well. Yeah, right. Pickled strawberries. Wow. Huh. Very interesting stuff. All right. So now with all that experience that you've had, how has that molded your own experiences hosting competitions here in Australia? Uh, so... I guess hosting, we started here hosting like amateur competitions. So it was kind of your backyard job um, just to get people into it. Um, we held, I held one of those and a Pitmaster series. And then we jumped into a proper comp with KCBS, which was the Heat Beats uh, Turf Wars. And I think we had 20 something teams. It was the first ever comp that was held undercover. Um, it was like on Melbourne Cup Day, and it was the wettest Melbourne Cup that in the history of Melbourne <laughs> Cup. So it actually worked out really well, and yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, and then we've, since then, we've done a couple of Pitmaster series. We're doing SCA ones at the moment. Um, they've been a lot of fun. Just a one day event because a whole weekend away from your family, um, including if you're travelling, it's a Friday, and then you're getting back on the Monday. So I'm trying to trying to make them into one day events where you can still barbecue, still catch up with everyone. You can stay there for the night, but you're back home and doing, you know, all those other things that you, you normally do with your life. Yeah. The SCAs are, are really quite interesting. And one of the things that I love is the different um, opportunities for creativity that they afford the, the pit masters. Um, what are some of the hand-ins aside from the steak that you like to create for your events? Uh, so we've got a little series happening at the moment. Um, every round you've got wings, so they've got the creativity score. Um, and then we've got pork ribs, so there's no creativity score for that. So we're trying to balance having uh, SCA-style you know, creativity with actual barbecue. Um, so you've got pork ribs and then you've got chicken non-wing, which is no creativity score as well. So you've got a bit of both and it's drawing more people into barbecue because the creativity that some teams do is absolutely unbelievable. And you, you just you, you shake your head when you look at how, how good it looks and you go, you're not going to beat that. So we're trying to you know, even up the playing field a little bit. Yeah, that's quite interesting that you're talking about the different creativity scores. So I didn't realise that promoters had the 
flexibility or the the freedom to um, to create these categories and then choose whether or not they'd be marked on on creativity. No, so these categories already exist. Um, they're the only two, pork ribs and chicken on wing are the only two categories that exist on the SCA format that don't have a creativity score. Oh, interesting. Everything else does, and that's why we have to pick those two. Um, if we, we can make our own ancillary, so say we wanted to add lamb, then I guess we could probably implement there's no creativity score or there is, and we can, you know, it's like a promoter's choice. But at the moment, they're the only two, and everything else does have a creativity score. Right. And so what are some of the more creative handings that you've seen come over the table at your competitions? Oh, definitely margaritas. Um, they're just completely out there. Um, I think Forrest Lump did a, a pumpkin that was cut out and it looked like a face. It was just incredible. Like those guys just nail that every time. Um, and then even, even chicken non-wing um the moist boys did a jalapeno inside a breast and i know there was no creativity score but wow that was amazing a hot like a, a a stuffed breast with jalapeno with a whole jalapeno with cheese inside the jalapeno and bacon oh. and wrapped the whole breast in the bacon it's yeah it was incredible wow that sounds awesome i know that um you mentioned sheepdog there before i know he does a great um it's like a jalapeno uh candy or jalapeno toffee and yeah, he'll he'll right. he'll smash that up and sprinkle that over the top of his hand ins yeah uh, he's incredible too like, he made a hot dog out of ice cream um at his comp it's called cow couldn't believe it uh, <laughs> i'm pretty sure i got first place but he's very creative that's wild man that's so awesome so um just sort of looping back to the shop there because i i kind of took us off on a bit of a on a bit of a tangent there um one of the things that that, that I did notice that you guys do that I haven't seen a lot of other butchers do is you do deliveries. Has that come out of a, uh, of a market demand from what's been happening in the last 18 months or is that something you've been doing for like a long time? Um, we've been doing that for probably six years, I think now. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. It's only ever been small, just local ones because we're on the road anyway. We do a fair bit of wholesale around Gippsland. So vans are already on the road. So we just wanted to adapt to that. We made a website. But yeah, as you said, the last 18 months, it's been ridiculous. Um, it's really, it's probably gone up 90% on what it was before. And it's helped us because we can get to places where it's too far away. Um, the people in Werribee and um, the other side of Melbourne to come over. So they might pop over once a month, but the rest of the time they can just get it delivered. Yeah, that's such, such a great idea, man. And, and it just adds an extra opportunity. Um, for like a revenue stream for the business there as well. So that's, it's really good thinking there. Yeah, that's been very popular. I guess, I don't know if you've ever looked at a, a butcher shop's website before, but there's two ways you can do it. You can do it where you've got, well, this is what it's roughly going to cost. And, you know, you've got that. When we first started doing it, I did everything through Facebook. So if you wanted to order meat, you'd message me on Facebook. I'd get your order. I'd do it. And we'd, we'd talk about, okay, well, this is how much this is. Now with the website, it's, well, this is a roughly how much it's going to be. And because we had that great database before, they know that we're, they're going to get looked after in the sense that they're going to get exactly what they pay for. Um, so new customers, they, they go, well, hang on, 90 bucks for a rack of ribs and it might have only worked out to 70 and that's where you actually get charged is the 70 But the rest of the customers already knew that to begin with. So, yeah, we've retained all them and um, they're all very happy. Yeah, that's a great uh great idea and that's quite interesting that you've been able to employ that digital technology there to help you to help you to grow that angle so if i had to ask you what is it that makes kelly's meats unique what do you think you'd say to that probably the range of products um you know not not just rubs and sauces i think we counted the other day we had over 300 different rubs and sauces on the shelves but wow it's, it's more it's more the, the actual products that we're making. You know, we're making porchettas, uh, lamb saddle roast with cheese and bacon and uh, what else we got? All the bacon. Like we make our own bacon, all the cabana. Uh, we make ham steaks. So all those old traditional things that you don't really see anymore. Straz, uh, pastrami. So it's, it's just the variety. And then when it comes to low and slow, it's probably, again, the range and uh, the price. So we, we don't put a, a big margin on our low and slow stuff. Um, we try to keep it down that's for the turnover. 
And that's probably the biggest thing. Yeah, you can walk into us and pay fifteen dollars for a brisket, but you walk in anywhere else and it might be twenty dollars a kilo for exactly the same thing. So yeah, we rely on the turnover and yeah. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd, Ben Arnott. All righty, Luke. So now this is the third segment of the show and this is our lesson for the listeners uh, and for the viewers as well. So if, if, you, uh, if, if people are joining us live in the Facebook group for this recording, now's the time to start putting your comments and things into the comments section under there and I'll put them to Luke after he, after he finishes sharing his wisdom with us. Now, mate, you decided today that you're going to talk to us about getting into competition barbecue and given the the length and breadth of your competition experience. I'm really looking forward to this. So I'm just going to uh, zip my lips and uh, hand over to you and, and you can impart some wisdom to everybody. All right. Thanks, Ben. Um, so back when we first started getting into competition barbecue, there was no format really to start off as an amateur. Um, I ran two amateur competitions. I think all up there might have been 50 or 60 teams there. And Oh, at least half of them are still competing on the actual circuit now, but without that stepping stone, they never would have got into it. So what you need to do is probably as a person that's never competed before, look for those little competitions. Um, our SCA one, that's probably a perfect format for just getting into it. Uh, you're, not, you're not you know, competing for sheep stations or anything like that. It's, it's just a good format. Uh, meet all the people. There's only 14 teams. Um, you know, everyone gets involved. You can ask questions. Uh, you can join other people's teams as well. So that's probably a good stepping stone too. If you want to get involved, find a team that maybe is shorter number and join them and you know, get on the circuit with them for a couple of weeks and see what it's all about. Um, that would be the, the first part, I reckon. And once you do start competing, it's, it's about having a good team around you as well. And, people that are willing to put in the time and the effort because, you know, competition barbecue is expensive and, you know, you, you need to have those people around you that are 100% committed because there's nothing worse than, you know, having three people in your team and, you know, two of them don't show up. <laughs> Mate, I, uh, I I used to play guitar in bands and I remember one particular time we'd, we'd booked this gig and we went out there and the, uh, the, the lead guitarist didn't show up and I rang him. <laughs> I, I, I rang him. I said, mate, where are you? He goes, oh, I forgot to tell you. Someone offered me a ticket to Big Day Out. I'm at Big Day Out. It's amazing. And so I'm like, mate, we're here. We're getting ready to play. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm not going to make it. So uh, I totally <laughs> understand what you're talking about there. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's uh, let's uh, sort of expand on on some of those points for a while. You started to talk, to talk about um, small competitions, that you get, like, for example, your SCA competitions. How would people sort of track those competitions down? How would you, how would they find them? Yeah, so a good starting point is to go like all the major pages. So you know, SCA Australia, um, all the competitions get posted on there. Um, same as KCBS. There's not many KCBS comps at the moment, um, you know, for obvious reasons. But same as ABA, there's not many of them at the moment. But go like those three pages and all the information is generally you know, a little pop up there or you can go on their actual websites and you know, type in competitions and where they're at, where they where they are and all that kind of stuff. But our, our page, Victoria Barbecue Alliance, we post all that stuff up on there as well. Um, and anyone who messages me saying I'm interested, well, generally I'll take your name and your phone number down and I'll give you a call or send you a message and let you know, okay, this one's coming up and there's, a, there's two or three other guys that are interested. You, you know, I'll put you in contact with them and, you know, see how you go. Yeah, nice. So the, the, the first step then is to make sure you join the Victorian Barbecue Alliance group on Facebook. Definitely. Victorian Barbecue Alliance first. <laughs> then, yeah, <laughs> all the other guys. Look, I'm sure that um, – do you, do you promote a few comps on your Smoking Hot Confessions page? I do, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's another page that they all should get onto? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the, the community groups on Facebook are a great way to, to get in touch with people and, uh, and, and stay in the loop on all that sort of information. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and joining a team, how would you recommend about joining a team? So <laughs> de depending on um, where you live and you know, how far out you are, but if you've got a group of mates that are, you, know, you all do the same thing, you all catch up, it's, it's just about friendship really, um, a team. It, it, no, one's, no one's winning barbecue competitions and retiring basically. It's, 
it is a hobby at the end of the day and it's, and it's it's an expensive hobby but it's meant to be fun and if you're not having fun well then yeah it's not worth doing so just find some people you have fun with you get along well with and you know just make the most of a weekend away yeah that's that's funny that you mentioned that um you know no one's getting into competition barbecue and then retiring i um I had the opportunity to meet Myron Mixon when I was over in the States there two years ago. And, uh, you know, everyone says, oh, he's the winningest man in barbecue. He's won up like $4 million in prize money, whatever it is. I got to tell you what, he might be the winningest man in barbecue, but he's also got to be the hardest working man in barbecue. He was, he flew into Kansas City to come and see us for an hour. And then he was flying out up to Canada to go do another event up in Canada that same night. I mean, the guy is just, he's on the go all the time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like if, if you if you make it in barbecue, you've got you know you can make rubs and sauces, and that's 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 where you could probably look at you know making a lifestyle out of it. But if you're just competing in barbecue competitions here in Australia, I don't think you're <laughs> going to be retiring anytime soon. No, we're just not at that level yet. Um, I did uh, I I did get to interview a pitmaster over in um, Fort Smith in Arkansas, and. Uh, He's his place is Ralph's Pink Flamingo, uh, Pink Flamingo Barbecue, and uh, when I asked him about the name, I said, "What's with the name Pink Flamingo Barbecue?" And he said, "Oh, we we, we wanted a name that that reflected our teammates. So you know, we're, we're cheap, tacky, and you don't want us on your lawn." Um, <laughs> so, but he had actually he was a career banker, and he was winning so much money in competition barbecue that he quit his banking job to uh, to, to open up a barbecue joint. Oh, wow. that 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 just blew me away. Yeah, well, over there, I think they've got a competition almost every day of the year, and possibly you know two or three in the same town. So, you know, once Australia gets there, then yeah, it'd be, it'd be a lot more interesting. But we're just still in our early stages, I guess, of the growth. We are starting to get to that point, though. Just last weekend, we had the Brisbane Barbecue Festival, and it was a double header. It was the first time it's been done uh, as a double header ABA comp uh, in, in Australia. They did one on Friday into Saturday and then one on Saturday into Sunday. And uh, so I, I think we're starting to build to that point, which is quite interesting and um, quite, quite, I'm sorry? Yeah, definitely we're on our way there. Yes, for sure. Yeah, so good. Now, one more point that, that we need to get into um, is finding a good butcher. Now, obviously, if you're in Victoria, go to Kelly's Meats. That, that, that goes without saying. Um, but we are talking to the whole nation here. So what, what tips and advice would you have for striking up a relationship with a butcher or even finding a butcher that, that does low and slow cuts? Um, I'd be checking out all their if – you, if you know there's a butcher local, um, go have a look at their Facebook page, see what they're promoting, see what kind of things they're doing. Um, you know, most butchers can get all these cuts for you. But it's a matter of if they're an iconic kind of low and slow butcher. Like up in um, Sydney, you've got um, East Blacksland. Um, he's right into it. And you've got the low and slow meat company, obviously, up in um, Queensland and meat at Billy's up there. And there's a few guys over in South Australia as well. But you just go in there and just check out their range and just have a conversation and, you know, see what they've got on offer. Um, it all comes down to branding. If you go into a butcher shop and they've got a lot of different branding, that's when you know you're probably onto a winner. Um, you, know, you can go into any old butcher shop and ask for a brisket, but it's it's not going to be anything worth you know feeding to your family unless you're going to be um, putting it in a casserole. I was going to say, um, I I just went into my local butcher when I ordered my first brisket and I got a rolled pot roast. <laughs> and I decided, I, and so I cut the strings off that and I unrolled it and I smoked that and it really wasn't a good experience. No, you know, you, you're looking for marbling and, you know, we're all about brands. Um, every brand, is, then you've got consistency in the brand. And if the brand's not really, you know, cooking up that well, then you just, you just stop stocking it. But, um, you know, your Kate Brims, your Sher Wagyu's, your Bass Trades, all those ones are the big names. That's what you're looking for. Yeah, definitely. Sounds absolutely awesome stuff. All right. Now I've got a couple of uh, questions that have come through here um, that I'm going to put up for you here. Now, someone here has asked via Facebook, what's the most popular sausage? Ah, uh, good question. Um, at the moment, over probably the last three weeks, has been our farmyard sausage. Oh, a farmyard sausage. Is, is that like a mixed meat sausage? Do you get a yes. bit of each animal from the farmyard and put it all together? 
pretty much. So as I said, we make you know, up to 35 flavors of sausages. So there's always that little bit left over. So what do you do with your little bit left over? You make a new sausage. <laughs> nice. And they've been very popular lately. Yeah, right. So is that like a bit of pork and a bit of chicken and or, or is it just, it just depends on the day? Yeah, so it just depends on what sausages we make for the day, but um, they, they could be spicy. If we've made a lot of spicy sausages that week, um, you know, we've got garlic Kiev. Um, th- there's so many different things that go in there that it just works. A garlic Kiev sausage is, is an interesting idea. How do you get the... Um that that the the breading the the crumbs on the outside to uh, into the oh, sausage. No, it's, just, it's just like a traditional sausage, and then it's got the garlic you have kind of seasoning in the middle, and we add extra garlic butter in there and mix it in by hand. So, oh, okay, all right, yeah, because I I was imagining that the breading wouldn't end up real nice by the time it's been in the sausage no. meat for <laughs> for a while. Now, this the next question. I'm not sure if this is a stitch up or not. It says, ask him about cooking on a shopping trolley. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a stitch up or not. Um, no, no. We our last competition that we had here at uh, Kelly's Meats, uh, Sheepdog, Garrett, uh, Brett Gray, and Tom. They all came the night before, and we probably had a few too many drinks. And we thought, well, why not? We had a fire going. We thought, there's a shopping trolley there. Why don't we cook something? Because no, no one could be bothered going out to go get some food. So we went into the butcher shop. We got some uh, Marble Score 12 plus. Porterhouse, and yeah, we let um, Sheepdog go for it. Um, he's the state champion, obviously, and I tell you what, he, he cooked them pretty good. The colour was spot on, and they were delicious. And he had two cooking zones because of the uh, shopping trolley, so we're hot and fast, and you could rest it up here, and yeah, it was a very funny night. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. You, bas- you, you basically took that meme and made it a reality. Yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> we, Love uh, it, mate. Actually, we made a chicken palmer on there as well, which was absolutely delicious. Interesting. A shopping trolley chicken palmer. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like the kind of thing that would catch on up here in Labrador, I think. <laughs> All righty, mate. So that's probably a good point for us to start wrapping up the show. So I'm going to throw it over to you now. Give some um, thanks, give some shout-outs, give some praise to people who've helped you out along the way and make sure you tell everybody where they can track down Kelly's Meats on the socials. No worries. Thanks, Ben. Um, I guess first shout-out would be to Jay Beaumont. Um, he's helped me heaps over the uh, last two, three years of running comps. Um, he's always... He's always been the first one to go, well, Luke, you know, you can have a free entry to meat stock for your amateur comp for the winning team and things like that. Or if I've got any questions, I can just give him a call. He's quite happy to help. So he's been a really big help. Um, then Scott Coleman uh, from KCBS. We've run a couple of comps with him. He's been a good friend and um, been very helpful over the years. And now he's got his atomic chicken out. So don't forget to get some of that atomic chicken. You, you'll love that plug. Um, Trent Lawrence. Massive help as well uh, with SCA. We've, you know, we've had three comps this year um, and we had one comp late last year and he's been a pleasure to work with and he's always very helpful. Um, guess my missus for letting me travel around and do this kind of stuff. Um, you know, she's been amazing. You know, we've got four kids at home and I could be gone for two or three days but she holds up the fort. So big shout out to her. Um, yeah, and if you need to get some quality meat, just look up Kelly's Meats um, on Facebook or the Victorian Barbecue Alliance. I'm posting on there all the time or just get into the shop at Turidan, so 96 to 98 South Gippsland Highway, Turidan. Fantastic, mate. That sounds awesome. And you covered all the bases there and you remembered to thank the wife, so good job on that one. You'd be surprised <laughs> how many people forget. <laughs> no, look, I've probably forgot a heap of people. There's been a lot of people that have helped um, over the years and uh, we've, we've got a really good group of teams and people around us. So, yeah, we'll just keep pushing forward. So good, mate. So good. Well, look, thanks very much for your time. I really appreciate it. I know it's a public holiday down there for you and it's a school holiday up here for me. So I've we, we've both got a bit of time off here, but I do appreciate you taking time on a public holiday to, uh, to hang out and talk barbecue with me. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. Thanks for your time. All righty, family, there you have it. That was Luke Nagel from Kelly's Meats. What experience that guy has. I mean, he's been in butchery for 
over 20 years now. That's what we just talked about before. He's a competitor. He's competed in Australia. He's competed in the US at the Royal, the biggest barbecue competition in the world. He's hosted his own events here. I mean, the guy just is barbecue. It's absolutely incredible, all the different things that he's done. So now before we just close this out for the for today, I just want to give you a quick reminder. The podcast partner program is up and running. If you've got a barbecue business and you want to get your message out to the masses, send me an email, ben at smokinghotconfessions.com or shoot me a direct message through whichever platform you are watching or listening to this podcast episode. Um, if you're at the beginning of your journey, head on over to the website, grab your ebook, The Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. That's a great um a great resource that's available for you over there. It's completely free. And if you would like to be a part of these live recordings with these different comments and questions and things that we've had up, make sure that you do join us over at the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue community on Facebook. Um, it's a great little group. We just hang out and talk barbecue. And then we literally hang out and talk barbecue. So uh, yeah, it, it's a good time over there. And just if you're on the socials, do all the social stuff, the likes, the shares, that really helps us out as well. And just make sure that you tell a friend about it. That, that would be really helpful as well. And that is about all the time we have for today. So until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. <laughs>